Hello and welcome to second lecture in our ECG course. Our scope today is about ECG interpretation and this is one of the most important lectures in our ECG course as it is a question that every clinician asks himself. How can I interpret an ECG? So today we are going to give a way of how to interpret an ECG in a complete and precise way covering each aspect of the ECG. So our ILOs today are regarding learning how to interpret a 12 lead ECG in a precise and informative way and to learn the rules of a normal ECG. So in order to know how to comment on the ECG, we need to enumerate the points in which you or which you need to comment on the ECG. Number one is a standardization and number two is a speed. And these are the first two, two things that you need to check in the ECG paper before interpreting the ECG itself. Number three is the rate, number four is the rhythm, number five is the axis, and here we mean the axis of the ventricular depolarization mainly. Number six is the P wave, then PR interval, and then the QRS complex, then the ST segment, then the T wave, and finally the QT interval. Let's start with the standardization. Standardization is one of the first things that you need to check in the ECG paper as we told before. So we need to know that the ECG graph paper we have a small square, its duration is 40 milliseconds and its amplitude is 1 millimeter. And this small square is part of a large square. Its amplitude is 5 millimeter and its duration is 200 milliseconds which is equivalent to 0.2 seconds. So we can consider that the large square is 5 times the duration of the small square and 5 times the amplitude of the small square. And so we know here in the ECG graph paper that we have a large square consisting of 5 multiplied by 5 small square as we mentioned. And then we can find on the left side of the ECG paper that we have like a rectangle and this rectangle represents a standardization. It means here for example that if this rectangle is consist, consists of two large square this means that each one millivolt in the electricity in the ECG is equivalent to 10 millimeter. And usually the standardization is is set at this value. So when I see the standardization at this, this means that every one millivolt equivalent to 10 millimeter. So I can simplify this, that each one millivolt electricity will lead to a deflection in the ECG paper of 10 millimeter. So the usual standardization is usually 10 millimeter. Sometimes the standardization may be set at double the value, so it is set at 20 millimeter, and sometimes at half the value and see it is 5 millimeter. Usually we don't use the words usual, double or half, and usually we use the numbers themselves. So I can say that the standardization was 10 millimeter, standardization was 20 millimeter standardization was 5 millimeter so please don't jump to a diagnosis of low voltage complex before checking the standardization because usually it should be adjusted at 10 millimeter but sometimes the person who is doing the ECG may have adjusted it at 5 or 20 millimeter and he doesn't know so you may diagnose or misdiagnose the ECG as low voltage or in some cases if he adjusted the value of the standardization at high value at the time you may misdiagnose the patient as having left ventricular hypertrophy and this jumps to what are the causes of low voltage complex so for example if the standardization is set actually at 10 millimeter so what causes the voltage of the complex to be low which means that the complex amplitude is less than 5 millimeter in limb bleed it can be caused by pregnancy hypothyroidism, precardial effusion, COPD, or infiltrative disease, all of them cause low voltage complex. So the first thing to check in the ECG paper is the standardization. Now we are going to check the speed of the ECG paper. The speed normally is 25 millimeter per second. So for example, in each one second, there is a deflection in the duration of 25 millimeter. But the question is, why do we need to record ECG at higher speeds? For example, 50 millimeter per second. Higher speed will make waves wider and widely spaced, revealing subtle finding in troubleshooting ECG. So for example, if this ECG is performed at 25 millimeter per second, this ECG was performed at 50 millimeter per second and so the complex appears wider the p wave the t wave and also they are widely spaced and so for example if you solve this ecg without knowing the speed you may misdiagnose the ecg that it's predicardic rhythm no it is not a predicardic rhythm it is just adjusted at 50 millimeter per second so speed of 50 millimeter per second is not routinely performed no you ask for this specifically if for example you cannot identify the rhythm of the ecg in case of arrhythmia or predicardic 
cardioarrhythmia and you want to precisely diagnose a type of rhythm disorder in that case you may order the nurse that I want an ECG at 50 millimeter per second so the first thing before you interpret the ECG is that you need to check that the standardization is at 10 millimeter in order to accurately diagnose amplitude of the complex as having a standardization of 10 millimeter and you need to check that the speed at 25 millimeter per second then we are going to interpret the ECG itself after we check the standardization and the speed. The rate of the ECG, of course, from the undergraduate learning, we know that, of course, there, is rules, or there are rules for calculations heart rate. For example, if the rate is regular, so you can divide 300 by the number of large squares in the RR interval. So I count the number of large squares between two complexes and then divide them by 300. And in case of irregular rate, I cannot use the first rule, so I need to count the number of complex in 6 seconds and then multiply them by 10. Sometimes, in case of very fast regular rate, you can divide 1500 by the number of small square. And of course, we can expect where does this number come from. If we multiply 300 by 5, which, are, which is a number of small squares inside one large square, so 300 multiplied by 5 in 1500. But of course, the first one is much easier, is to calculate divide 300 by the number of large square in RR interval, provided that the rate is regular. So, of course, in order to simplify for clinicians, there is something called the rule of 300. That, for example, according to the number of big boxes in the RR interval, at the time you can expect the heart rate without using a calculation. So, for example, if the number of large squares is 1, so heart rate is 300, of course, because 300 divided by 1, it will be the same. If there are two large squares, so the rate is 105 and 50. If the large squares are 3, so rate was 100, is 100. If the number of large squares is 4, so it is 75. If the number is 5, so the rate is 60. And if the number is 6, the rate is 50. So for example, if we need to try here, how can we calculate the heart rate here in this example? Here I can count the number of complex in RR intervals. So here it is 6 large squares. And so if I divide 300 by 6, it will be 50 beat per minute. For example, here what is the heart rate? I will count the large squares in the RR interval. And so 300 multiplied by, divide, I'm sorry, by 4, it will be 75 beat per minute. And here in this tachycardic rhythm, I can tell that the RR interval nearly have one and a half large square so the heart rate is 200 before I finish the point of the rate I need to uh, emphasize on the fact that I can calculate the atrial rate and ventricular rate separately in the ECG and of course someone may ask why should I calculate them differently or separately isn't the atrial rate is always the same as the, vent as the ventricular rate yes in normal ECG it is the same but in some types of arrhythmia it is not the same so, for example, in complete heart block, the atrial rate is much larger than the ventricular rate because the intrinsic atrial rate is not transmitted through the AV node. So, the ventricle is paced by a scape rhythm, and in that case, the ventricular rate is lower than the atrial rate. And complete heart block is not the only example, as for example, in some forms of tachyarrhythmia, like in ventricular tachycardia, the ventricular rate will be larger than the atrial rate. So, for example, here, if I want to calculate the ventricular rate, I will use the RR interval and count the number of large square. And in order to calculate the atrial rate, I can use the PP interval, which is the interval between two successive P waves and count the large squares. So the ventricular rate here will be 300 divided by 8, it will be nearly 37.5, and the atrial rate is 300 divided by 4, it will be nearly 75 beat per minute. So here, because this patient has complete heart block, the atrial rate is much larger than the ventricular rate, and this is an important clinical point that will be important for us, for example, during permanent pacemaker implantation so you need to emphasize that each one can be calculated independently now we are going to go to the rhythm which is the point that will take much time in our lecture today first thing I want to emphasize that the rhythm is totally different from rate rhythm is not rate rhythm it is a matter of where is the origin of the electrical rhythm whatever the rate so the rhythm is completely different from the rate it is a matter of what is the origin of the cardiac electrical activity first of all is it regular or irregular is the first question I need to ask myself and then I need to know that I have three general types of rhythm and each one of them has subtypes within it the first one of course is a normal sinus rhythm and so, of course, it is the most common rhythm that you will find in most ACG. But there are two types of rhythm disorder, which is the supraventricular rhythm and the ventricular rhythm.
Let's start with the sinus rhythm. Sinus rhythm is a normal rhythm, and from its name, it originates from the SA node, which lies in the subepicardial layer of the right atrium. And it is characterized by well-defined persistent P waves, and of course, they are of the same morphology, one-to-one -one AV relationship. And when I use this terminology, I mean that the atrial rate is the same as the ventricular rate. So each P wave is followed by a complex. And the normal P wave axis, which is shown in the positive P waves and inferior leads, negative in EVR, it can be negative or biphasic in V1. So here I can find a sinus rhythm like this, where I find the well-defined persistent P wave of same morphology with one-to-one -one relationship and normal P wave axis. And the sinus rhythm can be in normal rate between 60 and 100. It can be in heart rate above 100. So at that time, I can call it sinus tachycardia, or the rate may be below 60 beat per minute, so I can call Call it sinus bradycardia. And we need to confirm by 12 lead ECG that it is sinus rhythm, as we mentioned before, by using the P wave morphology. So, for example, here P wave is positive in inferior leads and negative in EVR, and it is biphasic in V1. Because it is not just that if you find one to one AV relationship and it is the same morphology of the P wave, that it is sure sinus rhythm. Because some types of tachyarrhythmia, like the atrial tachycardia, you may find the same features. You will find one to one AV relationship if the even though the conduction was one-to-one -one, and you can find well-defined persistent P waves but the P wave axis is not the same as in sinus rhythm so checking the P wave axis is very important to confirm that this patient has sinus rhythm and so I cannot decide that this patient has sinus rhythm just from a strip of ECG no from the 12 lead ECG all the leads should be included in my interpretation then we are coming to the supraventricular rhythm. If we want to define what is meant by supraventricular, we mean the prefix of supra means above and ventricular refers to the ventricle. So literally, it means any rhythm originating above the ventricles excluding the SA nodes. Okay, so I mean, I know that some doctors may mean the supraventricular rhythm includes sinus rhythm because it is called supraventricular and the SA node is supraventricular, of course, but we exclude the SA node from the supraventricular rhythm. So practically, the word of supraventricular rhythm excludes sinus rhythm. If we want to know what are the forms of supraventricular rhythm that we need to speak about, we know that there is something called supraventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and atrial flutter. And of course, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter are specific different entities from supraventricular tachycardia. So please don't call the AF or flutter as supraventricular tachycardia, provided that they are tachycardia, for example, and they are supraventricular. No, supraventricular tachycardia is a different entity from AF and from atrial flutter. So let's start with supraventricular tachycardia. What characterizes supraventricular tachycardia or SVT as we call it? It is characterized by number one, absence of P waves. Number two, you can find the P waves sometimes shortly before complex or shortly after complexes. So in general, you may find absence of P waves, but you may find them shortly before complex or shortly after complex. So one of the three possibilities can be present in the SVT. It, it can be two to one relationship in some cases because sometimes of SVT like the atrial tachycardia may show two to one if you know the conduction, but it is not as common as a one to one relationship. Of course, they are narrow complex, and of course, it is regular narrow complex rhythm, and also you will find them in this morphology. Like, for example, here the SVT here you can find regular narrow complex tachycardia and here of course we can find the same you can find regular narrow complex tachycardia I, I can found some P waves here which are super embedded on the T waves themselves making like a hump on the T wave I need also to assure that some types of SVT may show wide complex which is called SVT with apparent conduction but it is not our point today and it will be discussed in a separate lecture now we are going to discuss the atrial fibrillation of course the most distinguishing feature of atrial fibrillation is absence of persistent P wave and please pay attention to the word persistent because sometime you may find some P wave or something that seems like P wave before one complex and you assume that this is not atrial fibrillation because of this single P wave no it is not a P wave it is something called summated atrial activity so absence of persistent P waves means that before each complex I cannot find a P wave so not just a single wave that seems like P wave before one complex it makes you refuse the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. No, 
absence of persistent P waves, it means atrial fibrillation. Plus, of course, I would find fibrillatory waves, which are sometimes called F waves, and the atrial rate is extremely high. It may range from 400 to 600, and of course, it is very difficult or extremely difficult to calculate. But physiologically, it is atrial rate in atrial fibrillation is 400 to 600, and as well as it shows irregular irregularity. So I cannot find atrial fibrillation with regular rate except if there is complete heart block on top of the AF. But AF itself should be a regular irregularity because the atrial rate is irregularly irregular and so the ventricular rate will be also irregularly irregular. Of course, it will be non-complex in most of the case, but in some cases it may be wide complex. I can call it AF with apparency or in some critical cases, something called pre-excited AF, it may show wide complex atrial fibrillation, and of course it will be discussed in a separate lecture. So I can find here that the AF here, for example, there are no persistent P waves, fibrillatory waves, irregular irregularity, and they are narrow complex, and here's the same, but here the heart rate is nearly controlled. So for example, if the heart rate, for example, is above 110, I will call it AF with rapid ventricular rate, and if the heart rate is between 60 and 110, I would call it AF with control ventricular rate if the heart rate is below 60 beat per minute I would call it AF with slow ventricular rate and try to use this term instead of rapid AF or slow AF because rapid AF and slow AF are misnomers because atrial fibrillation itself is a very rapid rate inside the atrium but when we call the rapid and slow we mean the ventricular rate not the atrial rate and so better to use the term AF with rapid ventricular rate controlled ventricular rate or slow ventricular rate now we are moving to atrial flutter, which is an unco un not uncommon arrhythmia to see in your practice. You would see flutter waves in the form of CO2 appearance, which is a classic pattern of the atrial fibrillation, although it is not present in all forms of atrial flutter, but it is the most classic description of atrial flutter. The atrial rate is usually 300, and this is an important clinical tip that usually the atrial rate is fixed at that rate, sometimes it is slightly higher or slightly lower. It can be regular, for example, 2 to 1 conduction, or less commonly 1 to 1 or 3 to 1. So in most of the cases, you will find flutter which, with regular rate, and usually it is 2 to 1, so usually the ventricular rate is 150 beat per minute because it would be the half of the atrial rate. But it can be irregular, like in some form of variable pattern of AV conduction. So for example here, I could see atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction, as we can see that there is a P wave just at the end of the complex, and there is another P wave just after the T waves. So we have two flutter waves before each complex, so it is atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction and so it is regular because it is a fixed pattern of AV conduction and of course we can find the same here and here I can find that it is atrial flutter as known by the sotus appearance in the atrial rhythm but it is irregular because the pattern of AV conduction is variable sometimes to 2 to 1 sometimes it's 3 to 1 sometimes it may be 4 to 1 so atrial flutter can be regular like in the majority of the cases but in few cases it may be irregular now we need to know what's meant by junctional rhythm. We know the word junction refers to the AV junction, which is usually referred to the area of the AV node. So when I say junction rhythm, I mean rhythm originating from the AV junction, which is usually the AV nodes. So the junction rhythm is a rhythm, as we mentioned, originating from the AV junction, and it is regular narrow complex rhythm because it originates from the middle of the heart, and so it paces the atrial rate and the ventricular rate at the same rate. And of course, because it passes through the Hesperkinji system, it will be regular and it will be narrow complex. Usually, I can't see the P waves because usually the P waves may be usually are buried within the complex. Sometimes they may be retrograde P wave just before or just after the complex. And we know, of course, uh, the word of retrograde P waves. It means that the P wave is inverted, like it is positive, sorry, negative in the inferior leads and positive in EVR, as we are going to see today in our lecture. So, for example, here, this is a junction rhythm. As we know, it is regular, nor complex, and I can't see any. P waves. Here it is the same, but the difference that the P waves appears inverted just after the complex, and here it is the same, but the P waves are just before the complex and they are inverted here in lead 2. For example, here, if I see this ECG, I can see also regular narrow complex rhythm, but the P waves here are just before the complex and they are negative, and here it is positive in EVR, so they are inverted P waves, and here I can call them retrograde P waves because they are not originating from the SE node and they are low 
atrial rhythm. Some people prefer to use the term junction rhythm, but some other clinicians prefer the term low atrial rhythm because it is originating from the lower part of the atrium. Here, for example, I can see that there are regular neurocomplex rhythm, but there are no P waves or maybe just slight operation just before the complex, so we can call this junction rhythm. The most important point that regarding the heart rate, if I combine the rate with the junction rhythm, so what I would call this rhythm? If the heart rate is less than 50, I would call it escape junction rhythm. If it is between 50 and 100, I would call it accelerated junction rhythm. And if it is more than 100, it would be junctional tachycardia. So the junction rhythm, as we mentioned, it is a matter of identifying the ECG itself or the, where is the origin of the rhythm. And when I use the rate with them, I can modify the terminology according to the rate. So this is a arrhythmia, and of course junction tachycardia is tachyarrhythmia. Now we are going to the ventricular rhythm. Ventricular rhythm is a wide complex rhythm. Usually it uses shows AV dissociation. This means that the P waves are completely separated from the complex, so they are not following a rule of one-to-one -one relationship. No, they are dissociated from each other because the atrium is paced by the SA node and the ventricle is paced by a separate focus within the ventricle itself. So it would show AV dissociation. So here, for example, I can find that there is the regular wide, regular wide complex rhythm and it is tachycardic here. Here, because the heart rate is very high, I cannot see the AV dissociation. Here also I can see that there is a regular wide complex rhythm. If the rhythm is slightly slower, I can see the AV dissociation. And of course, if I combine the rate here with the rhythm, for example, if the rate is below 50 beat per minute, so I would call it escape idioventricular rhythm, which is a dangerous rhythm, and sometimes it may degenerate into bradyacystole. And if this is between 50 and 100, I would call it accelerated idioventricular rhythm. And if it is more than 100, I would call it ventricular tachycardia. Of course, the first one is a bradyarrhythmia, and the second one is tachyarrhythmia, and it would be discussed in the Rhythmians lecture. So now we have commented on the rhythm and we know the difference between the rate and the rhythm. The axis of the heart, of course, is one important point that represents the net overall direction of the heart electrical activity and the abnormality of the axis can lead us to a diagnosis of ventricular enlargement, abnormal rhythm or hemiblocks. And of course, we know this diagram that we used a sample of it in the lectures of basics of ECG, but the ECG axis, because it needs a lot of details in order to explain, I will discuss it in a separate lecture after the ECG interpretation. Regarding the P waves, what about the P waves? We need, to, of course, at first to know what is the normal P waves. In order to comment on P wave, I need to comment on the morphology, duration, amplitude, and the axis. The morphology is usually has a smooth contour, it is monophasic in lead 2 and maybe biphasic in V1. Regarding the axis, it is usually between 0 to 75 degrees, and it usually it is positive in lead 2, 3, and plus minus AVF, and negative in AVR, and this is depending on the axis of its depolarization, as we would see in the ECG axis lecture. Regarding the duration, it is usually less than 3 small squares, so it is less than 120 milliseconds, and regarding the amplitude, it is less than 2.5 millimeter in limb leads and less than 1.5 millimeter in precordial leads. So, at first, what are the best leads to look at P wave? The best lead is usually lead 2. Some also prefer lead AVF and 3, but lead 2, of course, is one of the classic ECG leads to look at the P wave and assess it. Lead V1, of course, and lead EVR because it shows the negative P waves in normal cases. So, it is a matter of the direction of P wave axis and the positive pole of the lead, and these leads to that these ECG leads are the best to comment on the P wave. So, for example, if I want to explain the P wave axis, if I have here normal heart, the levocardia, and this is the origin of the rhythm, which is the SA note. So, this is the direction of the atrial depolarization, and so I could expect that the P wave would be positive in lead 2, EVF plus minus lead 3, and is negative in EVR because it is directed towards the left lower quadrant of the heart. If the patient has dextrocardia, this means that the heart is reversed in and as a mirror image. So the SA node would be in the left upper quadrant, and so this is the direction of atrial depolarization. So it would be positive in lead three, biphasic in EVR and lead two, negative in lead one and AVL. And if the origin is from a low atrial rhythm like the coronary sinus ostium or a junction rhythm, as we explained before in the point of the rhythm of the heart here. The direction of atrial depolarization is completely reversed from 
below upwards and so i expect that the people would be positive in evr as reverse as in a contrary to the normal sinus rhythm and it would be negative in d2 3 and avf and in this case i would call them retrograde p waves so just think of p wave axis in a logical way and you will understand from where it is originating and i think by explaining this regarding the p waves we understand why the normal p wave axis that would explain in the rhythm is the same as we mentioned like positive in D2, 3 and negative in AVR. So the reference values for normal P wave as we mentioned P wave duration less than 120 milliseconds, P wave amplitude less than 2.5 in limb leads and less than 1.5 in chest leads especially V1, V2. Amplitude of negative deflection of biphasic P wave is less than 1 millimeter. So if I find a negative deflection or negative component of a biphasic P wave this is normal but it should be less than 1 millimeter. Sometimes you may be see an entirely negative P wave in V1 without positive deflection. This is also considered normal and don't consider this as abnormal. But you would not see this pattern, for example, in V2 or afterwards. Now we are going to comment on the PR interval, which is an easy matter in the ECG. PR interval starts from the beginning of the P wave till the beginning of the complex. From the beginning of P wave till the beginning of the complex. So it is considered like the time from the onset of atrial depolarization represented by the P wave to the onset of ventricular depolarization represented by the complex. So for example, if we expect the normal impulse conduction originating from the SA node and then passing to the AV node, then passing to the HES bundle, so this represents a P and PR interval, and then going through the bundle branch and the Purkinje fibers, in this case it would lead to the ventricular depolarization. So the PR interval represents a time of whole atrial depolarization till it reaches the ventricular depolarization, but it doesn't include the duration of ventricular depolarization. So PR interval, as we mentioned, this explains this time interval, and normally it should be from 120 to 200 milliseconds, so it is usually between 3 and 5 small squares. PR interval may be abnormal in some cases, so if for example it is long or prolonged PR interval more than 200 milliseconds, it can be caused by negative chronotropic medications like beta blockers or non-DHP calcium channel blockers, it can, cause, it can be caused by some progressive cardiac conduction defect like left disease, rheumatic carditis may cause transient prolongation of the PR interval during the rheumatic activity, some infiltrative disease like amyloidosis may lead to prolongation of the PR interval. And if it is shorter than normal, so it is less than 100 than 20 milliseconds this can occur in wolf parkinson white syndrome and it can occur in lgl syndrome which will be also discussed in separate lectures so we need of course to emphasize on the difference between pr interval and pr segments pr interval as we mentioned is from the onset of p wave to the onset of complex while pr segment is from the end of p wave to the onset of complex so pr segment is shorter than pr interval and always remind yourself segment in ecg always denote a straight line without any waveform while interval usually includes a waveform like p wave qrm qrs complex or t wave now we are going to move to the qrs complex qrs complex of course in order to understand we know to, we need to know the rules of complex nomenclature the first positive wave is usually labeled R, small or capital according to the amplitude, but the first positive wave in a complex is called R wave. The second positive wave is called R dash, whether small or capital according to the amplitude as well. The first negative wave is labeled Q wave, and the negative wave which follows the R wave is labeled S wave, capital or small according to the amplitude, and any wave that is entirely negative is labeled QS wave. And of course, lowercase, lowercase letters denote small waves and uppercase letters denote large waves. So, for example, how can I call this complex? It is an entirely one positive wave and it is large amplitude, so I would call it R capital wave. Here it is the same, but it is smaller amplitude, so I would call it R small. Here I can find a negative wave followed by a large positive wave, so it is Q small R capital. Here I can find small negative wave, then large positive wave, then second negative small wave, so I would call it Q small R capital S small. Here I would call it Q capital R small and S small, I now know, I know the rules now. Here I would call this because it is an entirely negative wave Q S capital and here I would consider this as Q capital and then R small as I find our first large negative wave followed by a small positive wave. Here I would call this wave as 
R capital S small, this wave would be called R small S capital. This wave, it would be Q called QS wave as well, but because it is a small amplitude, I would use lowercase letters. And here, this wave has two positive waves separated by a negative wave, so I would call it RSR dash. And here, because the second positive wave is larger, I would call it RSR dash, but R dash would be capital. So it is easy. If you know the rules, you can call any complex accurately according to the rules that we mentioned before. Now we need to know the rules for normal QRS complex. We would use the same rules that we used for the P wave, morphology, duration, amplitude, and axis. Of course, axis, it would be, we mentioned before that it would be discussed in a separate lecture, so I would not discuss it now. Amplitude would be discussed in the lecture of the chamber enlargement, so I would not discuss it now. But now I would comment on two important things in the QRS complex, which is the duration and the morphology. Complex duration should be also less than 120 milliseconds, so the duration here would be 3 small square, and complex morphology should show something called normal R wave progression in chest leads, so it would be small R wave in V1, and then it would get larger and larger and larger till you reach V6. And so the term Y complex is a term that is considered by some cardiologists as a non-specific term that includes complex duration more than 120 milliseconds. For example, it includes left bundle, right bundle, and intraventricular conduction delay. And of course, these items will be discussed in separate lecture as well today because we are focusing on how to interpret the ECG. And which features you need to comment on the QRS complex? as we mentioned the duration, as well as the R wave progression. And R wave progression, as we mentioned in the morphology of the complex, it means a progressive increase in the R wave amplitude in precordial read as it starts small and then it gets larger. So normally RS ratio in V1 is less than one and it is more than one in V6. So here, for example, in chest leads, I can see normal R wave progression as we know the R wave gets larger as we move from V1 till V6. And here, because the progression of R wave is slightly slower that till V5 I find that R wave is smaller than S wave so this is called poor R wave progression and here for example I see an abnormal form in which I see tall R wave in V1 which is reversed to normal because normal I show I see small R wave in V1 and then it gets larger as we move toward V6 so this is called tall R wave in V1 the causes of tall R wave in V1 includes RV dominance, for example, in children, RVH, right on the branch block, posterior myocardial infarction, wolf parkinson white syndrome type 1, which is caused by left free wall accessory pathway, incorrect lead placement, for example, V1 and V3 are replaced, dextrocardia and the hypertrophic cardiac myopathy, all of them cause tall R wave in V1. So now we have commented on the complex in general in order to know what to interpret the ECG to know whether it is normal or abnormal. Now we are going to move to the ST segment. ST segment, of course, we know it is the segment between the end of the complex till the start of T wave, as, as this called segment, so it doesn't include any waveform. We need to know that there is something called the J point. J point is a reference point to assess the ST segment, which is the start of the segment. So J point is considered like the end of the complex and the start of the ST segment. And when I consider ST segment as isoelectric, elevated or depressed, I see or I look at the J point and then I consider them whether isoelectric elevated or depressed. ST segment is usually isoelectric or normally it is isoelectric of course, except in V1 and V2 where it may be slightly elevated. And so remember, always look at the J point. And when I mean isoelectric J points, I need to know in comparison to what? You need to have something like a reference in order to consider the ST segment by looking at the J point as isoelectric elevated or depressed. And the reference here is something called TP segment. From its name, TP segment is a segment between the end of the T wave till the start of the P wave. And this segment represents the time between two cardiac cycles. Here there is no electrical activity after the end of ventricular depolarization till the start of new atrial depolarization. So TP segment should be isoelectric and ST segment would be compared to the TP segment in order to consider this whether isoelectric, elevated or depressed. So TP segment is a zero point, of course. We know that there are features suggested by the European Society of Cardiology in the guidelines of myocardial infarction in 2000 and 
uh, 18 and then they showed the ECG manifestations that are suggestive of acute myocardial ischemia which will be discussed of course in the ECG of or ischemic change in the ECG lectures and they define the ST elevation as new ST elevation at the J point in two contiguous leads with a cutoff point of more than one millimeter in all leads other than V2 and V3 in V2 and V3 because they are sometimes normally show ST elevation in order to define ST elevation in V2 and V3 they use a cutoff point of two millimeter in men more than 40 years 2.5 millimeter in men less than 40 years 1.5 millimeter in women regardless of age there are of course different patterns of ST elevation that we are going to find in the ischemic change in ECG lecture and I need also to assess when you see ST elevation in ECG you need to assess the magnitude of ST elevation how much millimeter is the ST segment elevated distribution of ST elevation which ECG leads show ST elevation and whether there is accompanying reciprocal depression or not and STEMI of course will be the first thing to die or the first diagnosis to come in your mind when you see ST elevation because it's the most grave diagnosis ST elevation myocardial infarction but we need to know that there are other causes like pericarditis, myocarditis, LV aneurysm, hyperkalemia, early repolarization, Progada syndrome and the chronic cleft bundle and this will be discussed in detail in the ischemic changes so STEMI is still the first diagnosis to think of but it is not the only one and there is a rule or a classic rule mentioning that concave ST elevation is usually a better prognosis like pericarditis and convex ST elevation is worse prognosis like in STEMI it is not a solid rule although it is common but don't depend on them but of course you will hear it or read it in a lot of books so still ST elevation and take it serious whether it is a STEMI or it is other diagnoses ST depression also has other forms sometimes they are classified into horizontal ST depression like in the first image or image number A sometimes they are diagnosed as downsloping ST depression like here in the second image and sometimes they are diagnosed as upsloping ST depression now we are going to move to the T wave which is the wave representing ventricular repolarization. In order to know what are the abnormalities that I would see in the T wave, I need to have the rules. The first rule is that QRS and T waves tend to have the same direction in all the limb leads. So usually you will find that if QRS is positive, T wave would be positive. If QRS is negative, T wave would be negative. T wave must be upright in lead 1, 2, and from V2 to V6. I'm speaking, of course, about normal ECG. T wave must be negative in AVR. As the complex is negative in AVR, so of course T wave would also be negative. And T wave may start negative in V1 and then it turn positive in the rest of chest plate. Second thing, normal T wave is asymmetrical. What is meant by asymmetrical? Asymmetrical, as we see in this image, it means that there is slow ascending slope rounded peak then the rapid descending slope so when i'm speaking about symmetrical or asymmetrical i'm speaking in one lead about the ascending limb and descending limb of t wave normally they are asymmetrical and so the slope is different and this asymmetry is more pronounced when the heart rate is slow but when the heart rate gets faster at the time this asymmetry would be reduced T wave axis and polarity, of course, is important as we mentioned that the polarity of the T wave follows the QRS complex and so it is positive in lead 1, 2 and from V2 to V6 and negative in AVR and usually it is positive in lead 3 and AVF but sometimes they may be negative or biphasic in some normal individuals. Also, of course, we need to know that T wave is often negative in V1. As we mentioned, we didn't mention them in the positive T waves. And the transition wave zone of the T wave travels to the right with age. So, for example, if in children, for example, or teenagers, transition zone would be between V3 and V4. So I can find negative T waves in V1, V2, something called juvenile T wave pattern. In adults, the transition would be between V1 and V2. Sometimes you may find positive V1 uh, T wave in V1 and the negative deflection of the T wave after V1 is very rare beyond 50, 15 years of age so most of the people by the age of 15 you would find that the T wave in V2 would be positive and some obese patients you may find negative T wave in V2 and V3 there was a rule that I was learned by one of my seniors that he told me that once T wave the T wave may start negative in the precordial lead and once it turned positive usually in V2 it would not turn negative again
Regarding the amplitude, because of course we hear the term of hyperacuity wave or low voltage T wave. T wave amplitude is measured from the baseline to the peak of the T wave. It is proportional to the QRS complex. It should be less than two thirds of the complex and more than 10% of the R wave. And usually the T wave amplitude decreases with age. And normal T wave measures less than five millimeter in limb leads and less than 10 millimeter in precordial leads. So remember when I mentioned the term hyperacute T wave, it means that the T wave is more than two thirds of the complex amplitude. Now let's see what are the abnormalities that I could see in T-Wave. I could see T-Wave inversion, biphasic T-Wave or hyperacute hyper T-Wave. T-Wave inversion could be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Hyperacute T-Wave, as we mentioned, the amplitude of the T-Wave should be less than two-thirds of the complex. So if the T-Wave is more than two-thirds of the complex amplitude, I can call them hyperacute T-Wave. And of course, hyperacute T-Wave is a grave sign in ACG because it may be the sign that precedes T elevation in patient with STEMI. So if you see hyperacute T-Wave in a patient presenting with chest pain, repeat the ACG after about five minutes, you may find frank ST elevation. So a hyperacute T-Wave is a grave sign in ECG. It may happen, of course, with hyperkalemia as well, but it is one of the most important things to think of is STEMI. And there is like a funny rule regarding the hyperacute T wave. The hyperacute, if it is symmetrical and narrow base and pointed, like for example, it is very sharp at the end or at the peak, it usually suggests hyperkalemia. While if it is symmetrical and broad base and not pointed, usually it suggests myocardial ischemia. And if it is asymmetrical hyperacute T wave, usually it may be a normal variant. Of course, it is like a rule that some clinicians use in order that by clinical sense, he can suggest whether it is, hyper, it is hyperkalemia or myocardial ischemia. But of course, you need to stick to the rules that hyperacute T wave, you need to exclude myocardial ischemia. Regarding T-wave inversion, we have something called deep symmetrical T-wave inversion. Here I can find that the T-wave is not asymmetrical as we ex explained before, no, they are symmetrical. So the slope of the ascending limb and descending limb while the T-wave is inverted is symmetrical. And usually they are deep because they are more than two thirds of the complex. And of course, this may signify myocardial ischemia. So deep symmetrical T-wave inversion is also a great sign that may suggest myocardial ischemia. Whereas asymmetrical T wave inversion, where the descending limb doesn't have the same slope as the ascending limb, but they are deep, this may suggest something called secondary repolarization abnormalities that may happen with ventricular hypertrophy and may also happen with bundle branch block and may occur in some structural heart disease. So here, for example, I can find that the T wave in V1 was like slow amplitude, but in V2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it is negative and inverted. So it is something abnormal. So this suggests presence of repolarization abnormality. T wave inversion, of course, has a lot of causes like myocardial ischemia, secondary repolarization abnormality, as we mentioned, hypokalemia, digoxin effect, which is called a sagging, pericarditis, myocarditis, some neurological insult like the subarachnoid hemorrhage may cause T wave inversion and cardiac contusion. So there are a lot of causes, and so T wave inversion should be interpreted in the clinical situation or the clinical presentation of the patient. Of course, Many of us heard about something called U-Wave. I didn't put them in the 11 points that we need to comment on the ACG. But of course, many people, when you read in the literature, they read this term and some clinician use the term that there is a U-Wave in the ACG. What is a U-Wave? U-Wave, as we know, that it is a small low amplitude wave, sometimes appearing shortly after the T-Wave as we see here. What does it represent? It represents delayed repolarization of Purkinje fibers. This is one of the theories. Another theory is that it is prolonged repolarization of the mid-myocardial cells, some, something called M-cells, and they may be after potentials resulting from mechanical forces in the ventricular wall. U-Wave has some criteria. Usually it goes in the same direction as the T-Wave, Usually it is inversely proportional to the heart rate, so it is bigger as the heart rate slows down. It usually becomes visible when the heart rate is less than 65 beat per minute. It is the same as the second rule. Voltage is usually less than 25% of the T wave. So if I said that the T wave should be less than two thirds of the complex, the U wave should be less than one quarter of the T wave. And the maximum amplitude is usually one to two millimeter. So here, for example, I can see that there is a small low amplitude wave that is shortly after the T wave. And U waves sometimes may be prominent, this means that they are more than 2 mm or more than 25% of the T wave amplitude. This may occur in bradycardia, may occur in severe hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, hypothermia, raised intracardiac 
intracranial pressure, LVH, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, drugs like class 1A and the class 1C antiarrhythmic. And you can notice that many of the conditions causing prominent U wave cause long QT as well. So U waves is one of the ways that you may see normally in the ECG, but you need to know its criteria in order to consider them whether they are normal or abnormal. Last thing and one of the most irritating features in the ECG for many clinicians, especially non-cardiologists, is the QT interval. QT interval is the interval between the start of the complex till the end of T wave. So it represents the whole time for ventricular depolarization plus ventricular repolarization. So for example, PR interval is from the start of P wave to the start of complex, while the QT interval from the start of complex to the end of T wave. So PR interval include only one waveform, which is a P wave, whereas the QT interval include two waveform, which are the complex and the T wave. The first thing is how to calculate the QT interval because it is not as easy as the PR interval. First thing, you need to take several successive beats to measure the QT interval and take the longest interval in them. Large U waves that are fused to the T wave should be included in the measurement. So if you have a U wave that is fused with the T wave, include it. But if the U wave is small and separate from the T wave, so exclude it from the measurement. And we are going to use something called maximum slope intercept method to define the end of the T wave. Let's apply these rules. For example, here in the first image to the left, I can find that the U wave is separate from the T wave, so I exclude it from the measurement. But in the second measure, the U wave was fused with the T wave that the T wave appears like pivot. It appears like it is one pivot wave, and so it was included in the measurement. And as we use the maximum slope intercept method, I will not draw a vertical line across the end of the T wave. No, I would have like an oblique line along the maximum slope of the descending limb of the T wave. And at the intersection point between this oblique line and between the isoelectric line, this will be the end of the T wave. So please use the maximum slope intercept method as it is shown here in order to define the end of the T wave and so you can calculate the QT interval. And when not a T wave as we mentioned is present at that time, QT interval is measured from the beginning of the complex to the intersection point between the tangent and the maximum down slope of the second notch as we mentioned that it is usually a small U wave fused with the T wave. Is it, uh, is it that simple? Yes, to measure the QT interval is a simple way, but the problem is that it is not only the QT interval that we are concerned about. We are concerned about something called corrected QT, which is corrected to the heart rate. And of course, we need to ask ourselves why? Why do we need to correct the QT interval to the heart rate? QT interval, it lengthens with the bradycardia and shortens with the tachycardia. So for example, a QT interval value of 430 milliseconds with a heart rate of 60 doesn't have the same value with a heart rate of 90 feet per minute. It would be more dangerous, for example, with a heart rate of 90 because I expect the QT interval to shorten with tachycardia. So the QT interval should be corrected to the heart rate because it is a dynamic measurement that differs according to the heart rate. And so there are different methods to correct the QT interval. We have a lot of formulas that I don't want you to remember all this formula. I want you to just remember one formula, which is the Pazit's formula. Pazit's formula, it means that the correct QT interval equal QT interval divided by the square root of RR interval. But remember, RR interval is given in seconds. So RR interval, of course, we know it is 60 divided by the heart rate, but I would put the denominator of the square root of RR interval in seconds, while the nominator of the QT interval would be in milliseconds. This is an important information that you need to use. And of course, if heart rate is 60, the absolute QT interval will be the same as the corrected QT interval, because in this case, if you apply the square root of RR interval, which would be one second in case of the heart rate is 60, at the time, the QT interval correct the QT interval is the same as the QT interval. So if the heart rate is 60, you don't need to use the Pazit's formula, but if the heart rate is above or below at the time, you may need to use it.
And a quick way to estimate roughly is a QT interval is long or not is to use the following rule, which is a rough rule, rough rule but not precise, which is if the QT interval is more than half the, the RR interval, usually it is prolonged QT interval, but I advise you to use the rule of the Pazit's formula in order to calculate the QT interval. Of course, now there are a lot of applications on the mobile phones that give you like a quick way to calculate the QT interval that you put the value for the RR interval here and then you put the value for the QT interval and you choose the formula which is usually the Bazit formula and then it gives you the correct QT interval in millisecond in order to define what is the QT interval for the patient. Because I know that some of you will ask some questions that if it, there is a simple Bazit formula, why there are other formulas to calculate the correct QT interval? There is a theory that sometimes Bazit's formula may not be very accurate if the heart rate is below 60 or above 100, and so other formulas like the Framingham formula and Friedrichia formulas are used to calculate the heart, the correct QT interval in case of tachycardia or bradycardia. But Paz's formula is still the most commonly used. But all of the applications of the mobile phone give you the choice to choose which formula to, to use in calculation of the correct QT interval. In order, of course, that we need to know the normal QT interval. Normal QT interval is between 360 to 460. That's a simple number. 360 to 460 millisecond is a normal. Above 460, diagnose long QT syndrome if there is symptoms. Above 480, it diagnose long QT syndrome if there are no symptoms. Below 360, it diagnose short QT syndrome if there are symptoms. Below 340, it diagnose short QT syndrome if there are no symptoms. So it is a simple image that you can put in your mind in the photo memory in order to remember what are the cutoff point for the normal QT interval for long QT syndrome short QT syndrome and of course I need to emphasize that corrected QT interval more than 500 millisecond is considered a very high risk cutoff point for tercet depot how many segments and intervals in the ECG that we have known today we know of course that there are three intervals PR interval QT interval RR interval we have the PR segment, ST segment, TP segment. PR interval is from the start of P wave to the start of complex. PR segment is from the end of P wave to the start of complex. ST segment from the end of the complex to the start of T wave. QT interval from the start of the complex to the end of T wave. TP segment from the end of the T wave to the start of P wave, so it is between two cycles. And RR interval is between two successive R waves or two successive complexes. So at the end of our lecture today regarding the ECG interpretation, I know it is one of the longest lecture in our ECG course. We learned today how to comment precisely and completely on an ECG and we learned 11 points regarding the ECG, two points in the ECG graph paper and nine points regarding the ECG waves itself. And we learned also when to comment that an ECG is normal. Thank you very much for your listening.